Hey everyone, before we get into the talk from the recent world tour, I just want to make sure that you're connected with Eyewitness because we've got more events, great content, and most importantly, the Eyewitness Conference coming up at the end of the year, which you won't want to miss out on. Now, you can find all of our channels in our link tree, but without further ado, I present to you Deacon Sam French giving us a talk on how to actually follow God's will and not your own. So tonight's talk uh, is called How to Follow God's Will will and not your own. Uh, just a bit of a disclaimer, if I seem a little bit awkward, it's because I'm talking silently to a screen. I'm not really feeling the vibe of the group. Um, so it's, uh, it can be a little disconcerting at times, but I'm going to try my best to get through it. So why is this an important topic? Why do we need to know the will of God? And I think the easiest way to answer that is with a show of hands. Raise your hand if at any point in your life you have had difficulty working out what God wants you to do. Raise your hand or your digital hand. Okay, so that's a lot of people. I think that's a good answer. All of us here are, are Christians. All of us want to follow God's will as best we possibly can, but sometimes we just don't know how. So the way I want to uh, tackle this talk is by talking about the discernment of spirits. So the discernment of spirits in a nutshell is a method of reflection devised by the saint Ignatius of Loyola, who we see on our screen here. Um, and that was way back in about the 1500s. The purpose of discernment is to figure out what God's will is for us in the particulars of our life. Everything from our small everyday decisions, all the way up to making fundamental choices uh, about our vocation, whether to marriage, religious life, or as a consecrated single. So um, I'm certainly not what you would call an expert on this topic. This is usually reserved to, uh, to the Jesuits. Um, I, I suppose I'm what you might call a satisfied customer um, offering my review on the discernment of spirit. So I'm a bit like that mate who gets into CrossFit uh, and they just won't stop talking about it until every single person in the world knows about it. So um, in that vein of discussion, I'm not a trainer, but I'm an advocate. So with that, let's, uh, let's jump into it. So the first and most important point I want everyone to remember in this is that what I'm about to say is only the most basic introduction into the discernment of spirits. But if you like some of what you hear and you want to know more about it, um, there's stacks of books on this. There's great podcasts, um, which I'm going to recommend towards the end of this talk. So um, this is only a taste test. And, uh, and if you want more, let me know and I can send you those resources. So before we begin on the actual subject itself, we've got to go to the author. So the author of the Discernment of Spirits is Saint Ignatius of Loyola, this, uh, this fine looking chap over here. It's <laughs> that hairline, I, I love it. Um, so, so Saint Ignatius was born in Loyola in about 1491 and he was the youngest of 13 children. Um, his mother sadly died soon after he, his birth and he was raised by the local blacksmith's wife. So when he grew up, he had an incredible love of the military, as you can see from these, uh, these pictures here, and chivalrous conquest. So he wanted to go out and slay dragons and rescue princesses and, and all of that kind of stuff, um, everything that was popular in the, in the Middle Ages. He's said to have been a great dancer and a formidable swordsman. Um, legend has it that he got in an argument with a Muslim man um, about the divinity of Jesus and bested him in a duel. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. Uh, he eventually entered the military in about 1509 to fight in essentially a whole bunch of local battles in Spain. Um, and he, he rose through the, uh, the ranks very quickly because of how dedicated he was to his military service. But in 1521, in the Battle of Pamplona, a uh, lovely town in Spain that both James McCulloch and I have trotted through on the, uh, on the Camino a few years ago, um, he was there and he was in this battle and he copped a cannonball to the leg. Uh, it broke one of his legs and it mangled the other, which leads to the incredible dad joke that Ignatius is the only, uh, is the only man who was canonized before he was a saint. So, um, look, I don't know if anyone's laughing or cringing or groaning because it's that awkward silence. So I'm just going to continue on. Um, during his uh, painful recovery, Ignatius wanted to take his mind off the pain. So he wanted to start reading a few books. So he's at his sister-in-law's house. I'm I think it was his sister-in-law. 
And he asked her for books on chivalry. She said, look, Ignatius, I'm fresh out. All I've got is the uh, imitation of Christ and lives of the saints. And Ignatius is like, okay, whatever, um, I'll read those. So he begins reading these spiritual books and he has this profound spiritual conversion. And this is where things become really important. During his conversion, Ignatius began to take careful note about what was going on within him, paying close attention to his uh, emotions and his interior movements. So he started to notice that when he would have all these dreams about uh, like romantic dreams of chivalry and knighthood and conquest, they would give him pleasure in the moment, but the moment that he would stop thinking about them, they would fade away and just leave him feeling like lonely and desolate and sad. But when he started to imagine uh, a life of saintly virtue, like he was reading these books, the emotions would linger. They would stick around for a lot longer and he would feel joy and, and a sense of peace. And this was really the beginning of his education uh, in the art of spiritual discernment. So uh, after a long recovery, which was very painful, uh, Ignatius left partially crippled and he moved to a town called Manresa. And while he was in Manresa, he worked in a local hospital, essentially working there in exchange for his lodging and food. Um, and while he was there, uh, each day for about seven hours, he would go off and he would spend the time alone in a cave, as you can see in this picture over on the right hand side. And it was in that cave over the course of a year that he wrote the book or the work, which is now known as the spiritual exercises. So the spiritual exercises. Um, in this book, the spiritual exercises, hold on, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm pausing my own screen here. Is everyone still receiving me? Thumbs up. Oh, good. Okay, great. Um, in the spiritual exercises, he laid out the, uh, the 14 rules of the discernment of spirits, but we don't have that much time. We're only going to focus on the first six of those rules. Um, first of all, in the interests of time, but also because I think they're the most important rules on setting us on this journey for, uh, for figuring out what it is that God wants us to do. So before we get stuck into the details of the rules themselves, we need to know what Ignatius meant by the word discernment and what he meant by spirits, because it may not be what you think. So when we talk about discernment of spirits, discernment is the process of distinguishing one thing from another, uh, essentially to figure out what something is and where it's coming from. And we've all had this experience before we're driving along the highway, we're listening to some fat hip hop beats, and all of a sudden we start hearing sirens in the background. All of a sudden we reach over and we turn down our radio and we begin discerning. Is that siren coming from outside the car, in which case I'm being chased by the cops, or am I just listening to a fat gangster beat in which the producer has inserted these police sirens for street cred? So that is a, essentially what Ignatius means when he talks about discernment. Um, but rather than sirens, we're asking the question, what are these stirrings, these feelings, these inspirations within our heart? Are they coming from God or are they coming from the evil spirit? And so when we get to the word spirits in this sense, uh, he really uses this in a way that we probably wouldn't. He uses spirits in a very broad sense. Um, by spirit, Ignatius is referring to pretty much anything that goes on within us, within the human person, uh, whether it be natural or supernatural. So uh, spirits for Ignatius refer to uh, emotional stirrings in the heart, everything from joy, sadness, hope, uh, fear, peace, anxiety, uh, and so on, as well as supernatural things like angels and demons and their effect on us. Basically, it refers to everything that can influence our life of faith and our progress towards God. And the idea of discernment of spirits is to know which feelings or spirits are coming from God and uh, which of these are not. So once we know that, we can begin making informed choices as to where God is leading us in our life and we're not just being led down the garden path. Uh, the problem for all of us in today's day and age is we're always distracted. We live in an internet age, an age of iPhones and Netflix and all the rest of it. Um, we're so often distracted that we don't have a clear idea 
of what's going on within us. So this requires a bit of meditation. Um, and the discernments, the discernment of spirit, I think, gives us gives us the tools to be able to navigate the mess that goes on uh, within our within our life. So um, the best thing about this method is it doesn't matter if you're a total beginner to the faith or you've been a Catholic um, dedicated to your faith for 50 years. Literally anyone at any level of spiritual development uh, can be led into a deeper and spiritual relationship with God using this method. And the reason for that is because this method is deeply incarnational. It uses the everyday stuff about us, everything going on in our being, our intellect, our will, our imagination, our emotions, things that we're using in everyday life. You don't need to get a PhD in theology to grow in holiness. So now we're just going to look at the first six steps of discernment. But just as one overarching rule in all of this, Ignatius said that these rules can never lead us to irrationality or to disobedience. These rules will never lead us to commit any kind of sin um, if followed properly, and they're never going to lead us to do something that is against the teachings of the church. If you find yourself um, going down that road, then stop and start again. So uh, you've, you've read something wrong along the way. So rule number one, um, I'm just going to ask Brother Bernard if he could jump on now. I'd love it if he could just read out um, this section over here. So we're going to hear now about rule one, the person moving away from God. So Bernard, could you, Brother Bernard, could you take it away for us? In persons who are going from mortal sin to mortal sin, the enemy is ordinarily accustomed to purpose apparent pleasures to them, leading them to imagine sensual delights and pleasures in order to hold them more and make them grow in their vices and sins. In these persons, the good spirit uses a contrary me method, stinging and biting their consciences through their rational power of mortal judgment. Awesome. Thank you, Brother Bernard. So what we're learning from this first rule is that it's not telling us to do something as such, but it's rather describing a category of person. Namely, a person whose fundamental direction in life is away from God. Um, sadly, all of us know people in this category, and we may ourselves have been one of these people at some stage or another. Uh, it's essentially describing here a spiritual landscape of a person without faith. They're caught up in the world. They believe everything the culture is throwing at them. The meaning of their life is basically reduced to seeking pleasure and just having a good time. God is either an afterthought, he's completely forgotten, or he's just not cared about. So uh, it's also important to notice here in the second line, um, he refers to the enemy. When Ignatius speaks of the enemy in this context, it's important to realize that he's not just speaking about the devil. Uh, a lot of people can kind of get fall into this trap, you know, the devil made me do it, everything's the devil. Um, but what he's actually referring to here by the enemy is traditionally called the threefold evil. So he's referring to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, or put another way, to sinful culture, our body's disordered urges and desires, and also the spiritual effects of Satan. So that's um, when he says the enemy, he's referring to all of those things. So in this case, when a person is moving away from God, the spirits or the movements within them are both doing different things. So the enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil are filling the person with apparent good things, filling the person with good feelings and the desire to go deeper into sinful things like drinking more, partying harder, having sex, watching porn, living only for money, for clothing, for beauty, and all that kind of stuff. While God, on the other hand, the good spirit, is doing exactly the opposite thing. When someone's moving away from God, God is, his spirit is stinging and he's biting their consciences, whispering in their ears things like, you're not yourself when you drink, or by these acts you're degrading your body, or there's more to life than money and possessions. So put most simply, when someone's moving away from God, God is trying to whip them back in line <laughs> and sometimes uh, it hurts a little bit. So that brings us to the second rule. And the second rule is the exact 
flip side uh, of the first rule. So Brother Bernard, if you could uh, just read that out for us again. Thank you. In persons who are going on intensely purifying their sins and rising from good to better in the service of God, the method is contrary to that in the first rule. For then it is proper to the evil spirit to bite, sadden, and place obstacles, disquieting with false reasons, so that the person may not go forward. And it is proper to the good spirit to give courage and strength, consolations, tears, inspirations, and quiet, easing and taking away all obstacles, so that the person may go forward in doing good. Awesome. Thank you. So essentially, this is the flip side of the first rule. This is describing a person who is on the path to holiness. God is important in their lives. They're trying their best to follow him. They may be struggling. They may be falling down along the way. But God is, in a sense, the ultimate goal um, in a, such a person's life. And I know already that there will be some of you uh, in the, the crowd out there tonight um, who are more on the scrupulous end, and you're thinking, Deacon Sam, I'm definitely in the first category. You know, I'm going from mortal sin to mortal sin. It's, everything's terrible. You know, I'm really bad and all the rest of it. But let me assure you, the very fact that you are willingly on Zoom on a Saturday night listening to a random clergyman in the Diocese of Broken Bay talk about the spiritual life tells me that you are in this camp. You are in rule number two, a person moving towards God. And so that's uh, on one sense, it, it is an encouragement, but on the other end of it, I need to warn you, because when a person is moving fundamentally towards God, the devil, the enemy, um, including the world, the flesh and the devil, gets up to all their tricks. So it's when we're moving uh, towards God that the, the evil spirit will start doing things like putting sadness, obstacles, and, f uh, and false reasons within us. For example, uh, sadness. Uh, sadness would be an, uh, the, um, something like, ever since I started you know, living according to my faith, life is just so boring now. I can't go out and get drunk with my friends. And I, I used to be able to party all the time, but now I can't. It's this obviously false uh, sense of, of sadness. Um, an, ob a, an example of obstacles might be someone who thinks to themselves, I want to get more involved in eyewitness and help the leaders more, but I've got all this study and this work and there's just so much going on in my life right now, I can't really commit myself to anything else. That may be an obstacle. Um, false reasons might be, for example, look, I need to look very professional when I go to work. So I need at least seven or eight $10,000 suits um, and these you know, particular shoes and you know, this incredibly expensive outfit or the other million <laughs> ridiculous reasons we give ourselves for living overly materialistic lifestyles and buying bows and arrows and things like that. So <laughs> it's, um, you know, they're, they're some of the ways in which the evil spirit can get up to his tricks. But in this person, God is, of course, doing the exact opposite. If we're moving towards God, inside of our interior life, we're going to notice that God is helping us. He's coaxing us forward with consolations, with inspirations, with a sense of peace, and often the removal of obstacles. Um, I remember the day I was at university and I realized with absolute conviction that God was definitely calling me to be a priest. But my biggest fear in all of that was what my girlfriend would think. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a bit of a challenge. And I remember being so scared. I was thinking essentially along the lines of, look, it's really not worth rocking the boat here. I might as well just pursue this, get married, and just try to ignore God for the rest of my life. Um, it, it, it wasn't really a, a viable option. So uh, but in this instance, God came to the rescue. He removed the obstacle that I thought was in my path. The Holy Spirit uh, put on, on her heart, on my girlfriend's heart at the time, the knowledge that I had some deeply unfinished business. And on the exact same day that I had this affirmation from God that he was calling me to priesthood, she raised this in conversation. Uh, and it gave me the opportunity for me to express to her 
what was going on. And then she gave me her blessing to pursue God's call. So in that was an, ins an instance where God removed uh, uh, an obstacle in my path. And I'm very confident that he will do the same for you. So regardless of what particular ministry you're called to, uh, what actions in your spiritual life, what your ultimate vocation is, God will ensure that you have the opportunity to follow that path but you need to be prepared to recognize that within yourself and be brave enough to take that step. But so that's rule one and two. They're about the fundamental directions in which we're going. If we're going away, uh, if we're going away from God, then God is um, biting us and trying to bring trying to bring us back. Whereas if we're going towards God, God is giving us consolations and peace. Whereas the evil spirit, on the other hand, is trying to draw us away from God. So the next four rules, which are a little bit quicker, they teach us how to recognize when we should act in our lives and when we shouldn't. So this is, this is where we start getting um, to much more important points. So rule number three is specific spiritual consolation. So Brother Bernard, if you could just uh, read this out again for me. Thank you. The third rule is of spiritual consolation. I call it consolation when some interior movement is caused in the soul through which the soul comes to be inflamed with love of its creator and Lord. And consequently, when it can love no created thing on the face of the earth in itself, but only in the creator of them all. Likewise, when it sheds tears that move to love of its Lord, whether out of sorrow for one's sins or for the passion of Christ our Lord, or because of other things directly ordered to his service and praise. Finally, I call consolation every increase of hope, faith, and charity, and all interior joy that calls and attracts to heavenly things and to the salvation of one's soul, quieting it and giving it peace in its creator and Lord. Thank you, brother. Um, when he refers to it in this context, he's referring to the soul. Um, and also, I, I've stood you up a little bit there, Brother Bernard, because it's well known that um, Saint Ignatius at this point in his life was quite uneducated and, uh, and his spiritual writings are very grammatically strange. He wrote in Spanish, but this is quite a close English equivalent and they haven't done much to kind of clean it up. So it can be a little bit clunky at times. So bear that in mind. It's not Brother Bernard, it's the, uh, it's the text itself. So... In spiritual, specific spiritual consolation, uh, many of us have had these experiences. The, uh, the hip and groovy youth, of which I'm no longer a part of anymore, uh, refer to spiritual consolation as uh, God moments. And I think that's actually a very appropriate term because consolations refer to those, those special moments in our life where we feel closest to God. For example, think of the, the incredible peace that we feel uh, after we've been to the sacrament of confession uh, or the love that we feel welling up in our hearts sometimes in the, in the quiet of adoration or the inspirations that we feel to live a holier life when we've been to mass or to eyewitness or to youth group or to some other event, whether it be in person or via Zoom. So these moments of peace, of faith and of hope and love of God these are really important for us to take note of in our life. If this ever happens to you, journal about it, write it down, meditate on it, and remember these moments, because these moments can never be copied by the enemy. They can only ever have God as their source. The world, the flesh, and the devil do not have the capacity to give us the peace and the closeness that comes from God. And this is very helpful for us to know in discernment, because it uh, because what it tells us that if we feel inspired to make certain decisions in the middle of one of these constellations, we can be pretty darn sure that that inspiration is coming from God. When we're feeling that sense of closeness to God and all of that stuff welling up in us, and all of a sudden we're inspired to do something, you can, you can bet your bottom dollar that's something that God is actually calling you to do. Think of a man or young man or woman who's just been to eyewitness, this is back in the days before COVID, they've heard a great talk about the meaning of scripture. 
and its impact on, on their lives. They can't quite explain it, but they're listening to this talk and they feel the Holy Spirit present in the words of the speaker. And they feel this sense of closeness to God that they haven't experienced before. All of a sudden, they make a resolution within themselves. You know what? I'm going to stop each morning and I'm going to read the Bible for 10 minutes. Just 10 minutes each day. I've got enough time for that in my schedule. That shouldn't be a problem for me. That kind of inspiration to, to make a little change or act for the better in your spiritual life in these moments of consolation are almost definitely signs of God's will. And the best thing to do when you're inspired to those things is to act on it and to make commitments. And that's why I said, write these things down, meditate on them so that you always have a record and can remember these moments. And I think the same principle applies not just for like prayer life, but for ministries and even your ultimate vocation to marriage, to religious life or consecrated single. When in such moments of consolation, a person feels that call, uh, they should really take solid steps towards pursuing that goal as it's very likely God's will for their life. Okay, so next one is spiritual desolation. And this is one that we've probably all been familiar with at some time or another if we've been uh, practicing our faith for any extended period of time. Uh, so, Brother Bernard, I might just get you to uh, read this one out for us. Thank you. The fourth is of spiritual desolation. I call desolation, or the contrary of the third rule, such as darkness of soul, disturbance and movement to low and earthly things, disquiet from various agitations and temptations, moving to lack of confidence, without hope, without love, finding oneself totally slothful, tepid, sad, and as if separated from one's creator and Lord. For just as consolation is contrary to desolation, in the same way, the thoughts that come from consolation are contrary to the thoughts that come from desolation. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So it's pretty clear here that desolation is the opposite of a God moment. It's like a, an anti-God moment, if you will. There are these periods in our life when, spiritually speaking, we just feel totally distant from God. We feel tired, we feel fed up, we feel bored, fatigued, and, and prayer just seems like the last thing we, we ever want to do. We just, we just want to do anything else but pray. Uh, all of our thoughts and our spiritual thoughts, they seem negative. And all of the things that we previously thought possible or admirable in that moment of consolation all of a sudden they, they start feeling silly or like you were too idealistic or they're just too much to ask. So um, desolation can, can wreak havoc on us, but it's important to remember that desolation themselves itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It's, in fact, it's a very normal and healthy part of a, a, a true and devout spiritual life. Because God can use, um, and in fact, he does use desolations to strengthen us in our faith and help us to become uh, more committed to our love of God without the need for all, all of the positive uh, emotion. And so, um, but on the flip side of that, of course, we're feeling down. We're in this state of desolation. And so the enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they can use this state of the spiritual life to lead us away from God. So... Desolation only becomes a bad thing when we let it defeat us. And that brings us to rule five, which is my number one favorite rule. And if you're only going to remember one of these rules, I beg you to remember this one, because this is where so many of us fall down. So, uh, Brother Bernard, could you uh, read this one for us? The fifth rule, in time of desolation, never make a change but be firm and constant in the proposals and determination in which one was the day preceding such desolation or in the determination in which one was in the preceding consolation. Because as in consolation, the good spirit guides and counsels us more. So in desolation, the bad spirit with whose counsels we cannot find the way to a right decision. Okay. So, as I said, Ignatius was a little bit uh, crazy with his grammar and the way he constructed sentences, but this is a very, very important point at its heart. 
to never make a decision or change course in the middle of a desolation. If I was not taught this rule in the very first year of seminary, I would have left the seminary about 50 times because it is so easy to get caught in a period of dryness and desolation and think, oh my gosh, God's totally abandoned me. I shouldn't be doing this thing. I'm just going to give up. I'm going to try something else and maybe that will make me feel better. You never make changes in this period of desolation. So when we're in consolation, think of it like cons that's the good, the good um, feelings of, of peace and closeness to God. It feels like God has moved up close to our ear and he's whispered instructions to us. But in desolation, there's so much noise that we can't quite hear what's going on. We're basically at the, the mercy of the enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They, these things seem all-consuming, and we can't see the right path. The solution for dealing with desolation is to buckle down and to stay the course. So like the example I gave before of the young person committing themselves to reading the Bible for 10 minutes, don't stop doing that thing just because you're bored to tears every morning for one week, two weeks, three weeks, or four or more. Don't stop doing it just before because you're feeling nothing. That's not the voice of God telling you to stop. It is almost certainly the enemy at work. So my advice is once you've committed to a task, to a ministry or a vocation, after being inspired in a moment of consolation that you've written down, you've meditated on, and you've remembered, move in that direction like a sailor who has plotted their course in the middle of a storm. So regardless of what's going on around you, hold that compass at perfect north and sail on in that direction. Don't make any changes uh, in your spiritual life. But then that leaves us with one question. And that question is, what kind of changes can we make in the midst of desolation? So what can we do when we're in this state to help us steer out of the storm. And that brings us to rule number six, the last one we're looking at today. So uh, Brother Bernard, could you just read this one for us? Although in desolation, we should not change our first proposals. It is very advantageous to change ourselves intensely against the desolation itself, as by insisting more upon prayer, meditation, upon much examination and upon extending ourselves in some suitable way of doing penance. Awesome. Thank you very much. So if we're going to continue on with this example of the person who is trying to read the Bible for 10 minutes a day and they're in the midst of this dryness and this desolation, they should never stop what they're doing because they're bored or discouraged. But rather what rule six tells us to do is to redouble the effort. So if you really feel intensely one day, look, I cannot be bothered. That's a moment for you to try and say, no, I'm, I'm not only am I going to read for 10 minutes, I'm going to do it for 15 or for 20 minutes or to do it twice a day or later on that day or in, in, on, on top of praying or reading the scriptures to pray the rosary, to seek out confession, to do a suitable penance like fasting or giving a donation to charity. So to do something more, and essentially, this is a way of attacking the, the enemy when he's trying to discourage you to kind of fight back, to slap back, as the, as the young people are saying these days. <laughs> it's um, to, to fight back by essentially doubling down on what you heard God say in that period of consolation. And of course, this seems completely counterintuitive. It, it seems completely crazy, but becoming a saint is a bit crazy and this method that i've just taught you or these first six rules will absolutely 100 percent put you on the right track so that's pretty much it for me that's uh, all i wanted to talk about in the in terms of the first rules of the discernment of spirits there's another eight steps to this um uh, to this method uh, but as i said at the beginning if you're interested in that there's some incredible books uh, the first of which is this one the Discernment of Spirits and Ignatius, Ignatian Guide for Everyday Living by Father Timothy Gallagher. Um, this book, uh, just in terms of testimony, personally changed uh, my life. Um, someone handed it to me for whatever reason years ago, and I read it, and it was actually by reading this book that I decided to join the seminary. 
Um, it helped me cut through all of the confusion um, that I was experiencing about God's will and gave me these, these steps and more. Um, but if you're not a reader, uh, if, you, if you're not into physical books, um, he actually, the author, Father Timothy Gallagher, has his own podcast where he basically breaks down all of the steps in here in a pretty comprehensive way in his podcast called The Discernment of Spirits, Setting the Captives Free, which, um, which I would highly, uh, highly recommend. So uh, those two resources are, are what I have to offer, but um, that's it for me. I'll throw it back to, uh, to Anya or to Claire, um, and we'll go into questions, comments, or, or whatever else we, we have in store tonight. Thank you, Deacon Sam. I'm going to get you to stop sharing your screen. Okie doke. How much? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Now I can see people. This is wonderful. Um, okay. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions coming through. Um, the first question is, with the first two rules, rules one and two, yep. um, this movement, is that a movement that happens moment by moment or is that a movement that's like a general trend of the will? How do we kind of look at that movement? Yeah, no. So I think I think it's a um, when he speaks about it, it's a uh, in short, it's a fundamental orientation of a person's life. So it, it's it's more or less an overarching thing because uh, not, none of us could claim that we're moving towards God in the middle of sinning. Um, you know, because we are moving towards God in a fundamental sense. Our we have a heart for God. We want to grow in holiness. We have a desire for Him. We want to overcome our sins. And yet we, we continue falling into them. We keep stumbling along the way. But that doesn't mean that we're, we're moving away from him in the full sense. Um, so this is about uh, essentially, you know, which direction on the map are you sailing? Yeah, that, that definitely clarifies it. I guess if it was moment by moment, you would feel very yeah. torn all the time. Yeah. You'd kind exactly. of feel a bit, yeah. Exactly. And I think he, he basically says in this, um, look, if you're in, if you're in rule one, um, you know, not much of the rest of these rules is going to apply to you uh, yeah. because you're not, you're not going to be interested in, in paying attention. But he said once a person had, and, and that's where his biography is helpful because he was living in this way where he just didn't care about his faith. He was just moving away um, from the Lord in, in uh, he just cared about uh, conquest and, you know, rising up in the ranks. But when he got injured, he had the time to stop and to uh and to read these books and he had a conversion experience and so all of a sudden um his direction changed and he was going towards god and that's when he started paying attention to what was going on within himself and that's where these rules came from awesome thank you yeah um the, we've got another question about the desolation and the consolation so if we're encouraged to um not make decisions in those valley times in those desolation yep. times how do we not risk making our mountaintop or our consolation um decisions be too emotional or too radical or you know sometimes we can get caught up with this kind of mountaintop moment um, yeah, yeah. with god so how do we kind of yeah, do we level it out? What what do we kind of do with that? Yeah, so um, Ignatius, like, and again, this is one of the short the shortcomings of not being able to go too in depth uh, with all of this. It's like uh, Ignatius was a big one on using all of the human faculties. One of them being uh, rationality. You know, so um, for example, like if you had everything set up in your life, um, you know, and look, and there's exceptions to this, of course. But if you were moving in a, in a particular track where, um, say, you're like a, a father or mother of a family, and then all of a sudden you have this um, this moment in, in consolation where you feel like you need to give your life to God, and in a in a moment like and while you're thinking about this, the idea of uh, you know praying before the Blessed Sacrament for twenty hours a day enters into your mind. Um, all of a sudden you know, you're act, you'll be acting irrationally if you start doing that. You know, a mother has p first and for foremost a, a vocation to love her husband and to, and to care for her children as the father does also. Um, and so in order to spend any ration, like that amount of time before the Lord, while in some sense it's a good thing, it's irrational um, and it's not sustainable. So when we have these mountaintop experiences, 
we write them down, we meditate on them, we think about them, and we come up uh, within that framework with a uh, with a reasonable way forward. You know, for example, the example I gave was of a person committing to ten minutes of prayer in the morning. It's not some massive um, dedication that's impossible. In fact, when they're thinking about it, and I think I, I tried to say this when I was mentioning it, they said, this is something that I think I can achieve. This is something that's doable. I've got enough time in the morning to do that. Um, and so that's a change that I can make. And so it's uh, we have these mountaintop experiences. We subject them to, um, to rationality while we're hopefully still enjoying that that sense of consolation, um, or you know, it's or, or at least haven't fallen into desolation. Um, there is a space between consolation and and desolation. And in that uh, um, in that image, I had tranquil time. So that's still an okay uh, period to make a decision. Um, but it's just about uh, yeah. So I think that's a sufficient answer. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense, especially when you said like the the overarching kind of uh, maybe not a rule, but the overarching kind of idea is that these rules aren't going to lead us into irrationality or into sin. So yeah, yeah definitely going too far, like, you know, adoring the Lord for 20 hours a day. If you're a dad, probably, probably not. Get to rational. work, mate. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you did mention um, doubling down on in, when was it? When was it? You mentioned about doubling down in terms of like, getting stuff done and like the changes we should make. I don't know yeah. if anyone else here felt personally attacked. I was like, Ooh, <laughs> how does he know that I'm not praying in the morning? <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then when you said like, I'm so not bothered, I'm like, yeah, that's me. And then, and then I just thought in my head, oh, do I have to change my 10 minutes to 20 minutes? That's even more hard. It's like, oh man, such a, such a challenge, but good challenging, good challenging. Look, if it makes you feel better, I was speaking out of my own experience. <laughs> Yeah, it's always, you always know it's a good talk, to give you a compliment, you know it's a good talk when something from the talk has personally attacked you in some way, shape or form. You kind of like, oh yes, I get it, I get it. Um, continuing on, sorry, that was just a sidebar. <laughs> uh, continuing on from talking kind of about a desolation or um, spiritual desolation, is there a time limit or a time frame that you can be in like spiritual desolation. So can you be feeling desolate for months or is it years or what does that look like? Um, I was having a chat to someone recently about um, my own vocational experience in, in terms of um, staying the course. And I don't know, I have a particularly melancholic um, temperament in, in a certain sense. And I would have described described my time in the seminary, and I, I mentioned this, I would have left about 50 times, um, as pretty much about a 70-30 split of desolation to consolation, uh, in the sense of most of the time I felt like I was just holding the course. Um, but I was given this rule in, in, in my first year, and it became just the most powerful signpost for me. You know, so many times I just felt like, what am I doing with myself? I'm wasting my life, I should, you know, like I could just leave now and, and get a job and, and, you know, get married and um, all these nice things that I'm thinking about could come true. But it was all coming out of this sense of like, I'm wasting my time. I, I just, um, and I had learned early on that you've just got to hold the line. Now, Mother Teresa is famous for having been in desolation for like decades or something like that. Um, so I suppose the, that length of time um, is dependent upon a person's sanctity or how much God wants to sanctify that person. But just as a practical note, um, I would really recommend having a spiritual director, someone that you can talk to about this because uh, one other thing about um, spirituality, as one of our spiritual directors at the seminary used to say, he would say, um, Ignatian spirituality has nothing, nothing to do with depth psychology. Um, and essentially, um, sometimes, you know, things like clinical depression and, and things can kind of get in the way of what's going on um, in a person's desolation. And they're going to need help discerning that um, with the help of a, a spiritual director or someone who can kind of separate out what's, uh, what's spiritual and, uh, and what may be 
um, you know, chemical imbalance or, or other, have other psychological uh, reasons. So there's certainly no set time. Desolation could be for a day, it could be for a year, it could be for many years. Um, it, it depends on the individual and God's plan for them. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And with spiritual direction, like uh, if if anyone here is is interested, we can give you some more information about that. And and I would really recommend talking to your parish priest first, parish priests first about it. Um, but it's definitely something that can help you when sometimes you've got things that just tend to float around in your own head. So to have an outside perspective um, it is also really really helpful. Um, this is probably a bit of a, a toughie, but how can someone like, you know, when we know that God is kind of calling us to something or he's asking something of us, how do we kind of just stop lying to ourselves and, and go out there and get it done and push through that, like that fear or, or um, the unknown? How do we kind of give us some advice on that? Look, um, <laughs> there's no, there's no like, <laughs> I, again, I can only speak out of my own experience. Um, I knew for a long time that I was lying to myself at some level about my vocation, uh, where, you know, I was, um, I just desperately wanted uh, to marry this person. I just desperately wanted that to be my vocation because that was what felt good. I mean, there was, I, I had grown incredibly as a person in the context of that romantic relationship. Um, I had learnt so much about what love meant, uh, what self-sacrifice meant. I felt like in so many ways I was on this wonderful journey towards God, but underneath it all, I knew at some level that I was lying to myself. And, and what happened for me was every time I would go into a church and essentially every time I would attempt to pray, my vocation would be there. The, like my con For the concern for my vocation, would be before my eyes. It was kind of like priesthood, priesthood, priesthood. And like a, a while, you know, for so long, I was just thinking, oh my gosh, will you just, like, I won't use profanity, but will you just go away, God? Like, this is just too much. Um, and he didn't. <laughs> uh, he didn't go away. And eventually, uh, he gave me the grace essentially to face it. And I think that's probably the advice I can give. Um, is really work up the courage, even give yourself a timeline to say, look, in a week's time or in a month's time on this date, I'm going to stop and pray about this and give myself honest prayer time to actually say, look, God, I don't want this, but if this is your will, let it be done. You know, it's literally the word of the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane. You know, Father, let this cup pass from me, but if it be your will you know, thy, thy will be done. And so uh, maybe, re maybe read that account in scripture and then just bite the bullet, turn around, face God and say, is this what you want? And then sit in that prayer for however long it takes to get an answer. Yeah, it's really important that we turn to God. I read something, I think it was on Instagram. I can't remember where it was, but um, it's it's meant to be this kind of like funny little anecdote where the person goes, shut up, God, I'm trying to pray to you. And it's just kind of, <laughs> sometimes you're pushing God away, but you're trying to grasp at him at the same time. So yeah. um, it, it can kind of be a little bit like that. But um, can you tell us, there, there might be some people here that um, are, are new Catholics or kind of don't know the difference between the different vocations. So can you tell us the difference between priesthood, religious life and married life? And then maybe chat about the single vocation too. Okay. Do we have any, uh, we've got may, maybe it would be better to kind of, uh, get some you know, um, audience participation. Yeah. I, I, th I think we have a bit of audience participation here. So, um, I mean, I can say that, um, you know, the, the priesthood, all, all of us um, are priests by virtue of our baptism, but there's a difference between the, um, the baptismal priesthood, which is uh, the calling to serve God and the church and the ministerial priesthood, which is what I'm called to, which is to, to serve God in a particular way, um, to minister the, the sacraments and be an instrument of God's mercy and love in things like uh, confession and the Holy Eucharist. Um, Brother Bernard, did you want to talk about religious? Sure. Um, yeah, so I get that question a lot, obviously, being a brother. What's the difference between a brother and a priest? Um, and I think 
the big thing is, is that because in our religious order as, as Franciscans, we have priests as well. And I suppose what's the difference between a religious priest and say a diocesan priest? Um, and it always comes down to the vows that we profess. We have the vows of chastity, poverty and obedience. So regardless of if you're a priest or a brother and you're, you join a religious order um, for that particular vocation, it's always down to the vows first. Uh, and that's how we live together in fraternity. Uh, and the same goes with the sisters as well. We all profess the same vows. Um, and then also a particular charism that you might feel called to. Um, obviously, there's only God knows how many religious orders there is on earth. Um, but there's one for you if, if that's where you're feeling called to, depending on what sort of life, what sort of ministry, what sort of char charism you're feeling called to, to lead. Um, so for me as a Franciscan, obviously, we have a particular vocation to service to the poor, to prayer, to life in common, fraternity, um, as well as professing the vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience. For me as a brother, um, I, I would be lying if I said I never felt called to, I, I never felt drawn to the priesthood, but I suppose in my own discernment, the thought was I would love to be able to hear confessions. I would love to be able to go and visit the hospital but ultimately, if that's all I wanted to be a priest for, then that's not good enough. You know, you need to really feel in your heart, in the depths of your soul, that I feel called to the whole package, you know, to the whole priestly ministry, saying the Mass. I love the Mass. I just don't feel called to say the Mass. Um, does that make sense? So I think for me as a brother, I feel called to serve the people in a different uh, ministry, different way. Um, and sky's the limit on that topic, of course. You know, I, I'm, I'm a trained teacher, so I could have been a teacher. At the moment now, I'm working with Broken Bay Diocese and helping to um, serve uh, sacramental coordinators in the RCIA program. So God will lead you in all strange and interesting uh, paths, and you just have to be open to him. That's awesome. Thank you, Brother Bernard. Um, Pedro, Michael Payton, could you uh, tell us a bit about marriage? Uh, sure, I'm not very good at it, but I try my best. Um, I'm Michael. I've been married for three and a half years to my beautiful wife, Amanda. We have one daughter, uh, ex-utero, and one child in utero <laughs> at present. Um, our daughter is 22 months old, and she just today got her first pair of glasses. So um, she's, she's going to be a glasses wearer, which is awesome. Uh, I... If I was to speak about the vocation to marriage and the call to marriage, um, all I have to do is um, talk about prayer and uh, laying before Our Lady of Chesterhova in Poland and um, discerning and feeling that, that strong call to marriage to my wife at that time, especially in a very, a very emotionally spiritual time of World Youth Day when when sometimes the you get over overwhelmed with oh maybe I should be a priest or um, going to religious life and then at that time feeling as such a strong call to marriage and um, then it's it becomes a discernment with the other person as well because at the end of the day on the altar the priest is there to witness the sacrament being delivered to each other the priest doesn't give you the sacrament you give the sacrament of marriage to each other so um, that discernment needs to happen together and the discernment doesn't stop at the altar the discernment doesn't stop at uh, well youth day the discernment continues always in how I can improve my vocation to my wife Amanda and uh, and the only the only thing that uh, I think is the thing I think is most important is to have no expectations in marriage and to leave let God be the only expectation. So um, that's all I have to say about marriage. That's awesome. Uh, the last one was consecrated single life. It's notoriously hard to discern because it doesn't have, there's no, um, there's no final point to it in the sense that when you're ordained or when, you or when you're professed or when you're married, uh, it's a, a definitive point in time in which you're cut off. So it's, it seems like there's a lot of stigma around the consecrated single life. Um, if someone wants to jump in and, and has discerned that vocation, by all means, um, I, I would welcome it. But my understanding of consecrated single is that 
you feel compelled by God to consecrate your life to a particular mission in the life of the church. Uh, and, and it's not within the context of saying mass. It's not within the context of a charism like Brother Bernard um, said, but it's to a particular mission to use your skills, your talents, um, everything that you, you are and will be for the service of God's church in a particular way. So that, I mean, that's my understanding. Thanks. And thank you for our audience participants. Thank you, Brother Bernard and Michael. Um, uh, I think we've, we've got a couple more questions. Are you okay to keep answering? Yeah. <laughs> Shoot. Um, so we all know that the discernment process can be um, difficult and it can take a, a bit of time, but we might see that, uh, people have gone into religious orders or into seminaries um, and then feel as though it's time for them to leave or um, they, they're kind of being called out somewhere else. How do they know that this is what God wants of them? Um, and how do they kind of reconcile the fact that, you know, there's obviously been a pull into that place and now that there, there's a call kind of outside that place. So how do they kind of, how do they know what, what, what God wants of them? Yeah. So, I mean, if we just refer back to the principles in these, uh, in these rules that we've, we've looked through tonight, um, you know, they may, there are instances in which God can use, um, you know, he can write, Right straight with crooked lines is often how it's uh, it's referred to. For example, for me, when I left high school and I was 18, that was the first time I heard God's call to the priesthood. I got super keen on it. I was speaking to a priest about it. I wanted to join, um, but then like my high school mates kind of like rejected me and didn't want to speak to me. And I, I, like all of these things got in the way and I was like, oh no, um, that's not that's not what I want anymore. And then I started discerning marriage, you know, by, um, you know, by dating. And so, and I was going along that path, but the reason I know that I wasn't supposed to continue down the path of marriage, uh, was because of the consolations I began to feel to priesthood. I began to feel that that sense of closeness towards God with relation to that calling. Um, and, and I, um, yeah, and so I knew that that was the direction I would go. For someone in the seminary, if they leave the seminary um, in a state of desolation or because they're fed up about something or, um, you know, that's, it may not be the right decision to have, to have left. You know, to, to be called to a vocation is to be called by God, not to be disgruntled with another vocation. Um, and I think that's probably the, the, the easiest way to say it. You know, you don't, you don't um, arrive at a vocation by cancelling out the other options or not wanting the other options. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, it's, uh, you know, it, like the, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I was um, at another talk last night and there was this analogy of um, Adam and Eve. Well, not analogy, there's a story of Adam and Eve, but the, the analogy was that um, sometimes we as humans, we're either grasping for that apple, we're grasping for the knowledge or, or whatever it is, or we're hiding. And it's really hard to kind of find that good medium where we're not trying to kind of grab things for ourselves and we're not trying to hide from something, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to our, our vocation but kind of find that, that middle ground. Um, we've talked a bit about vocations, but how does this kind of discernment of spirits, how do we look at it through a lens of maybe discerning jobs or ministries or other kind of courses of action? Yeah, I think it's the, it's the same thing, but on a smaller, on a smaller scale. Um, you know, I gave the example of the person who's gone to eyewitness and they feel as though, um, you know, after, after being there, being involved in that, they think, wow, I can actually see myself participating, uh, you know, in this, in this ministry. Um, that can happen at the parish level. You know, um, they might feel a particular calling towards music uh, in, the, in the parish level um, or, you know, running the youth group or any number of things in the life, uh, in the life of the parish. And... Uh, if that is something that has come to them in prayer, in the, one of these moments of consolation where they're feeling closest to God, then that, that's a really good decision to make. It's a really good decision uh, to act on if it's a rational thing to do. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, the same, uh, I think the, the same principles kind of apply just at a, a smaller level. The stakes aren't as high as a vocation, 
Um, but you know the, the same principles apply because if God, God's will is revealed to us in these moments of consolation and they give us that direction that we need to sail and we just have to essentially keep going down that path until we're told otherwise. You know, we might get to the point, for example, we've been involved in um, youth ministry for five years and then all of a sudden in prayer it comes to us you know that we um you know we might be called to to another type of ministry you know whether it be you know training the the altar servers or being involved in our adult faith formation something like that and it's a powerful call well that call would seem to suggest that they're being called onward from their previous ministry um and because you know it might not be rational to do both and so they should act upon um, upon that call and go there, but they shouldn't leave um, young adults ministry or the youth group because they're fed up with it. Um, you know, that's that would be a, an instance of uh, of desolation, I think. Yeah. Um, what happens if we discern the wrong way? What happens if you know we end up getting married, but? God's like original plan was for us to um, enter into religious life or the other way around. What's, yeah. What happens if you discern the wrong way? Yeah, look, um, I've, I've been asked that question before. I, I can't say I know the answer with any, with any real certainty. Um, the best answer I could give to this is that once we're confirmed in something, for example, once we receive, um, you know, once we have been sealed in the sacramental grace of marriage or priesthood, God will give us the sufficient grace to live that ministry. Uh, it may, in some sense, not comport with um, all of our gifts. There may be something in which we struggle more, um, like our charisms may not personally, like perfectly line up with, with that, um, that vocation. Uh, I, I suppose God could give an outpouring of grace in such a way that transforms the person after that. But my understanding is simply that um, God does have a calling for us that we are to follow and we are to find. But if we go against that and we make a decision that seals us in sacramental grace in, in one particular vocation, then God will accept that decision and give us the grace we need, um, the sufficient grace to live it. I suppose it, it becomes an unanswerable question beyond that, um, which is what could that person have been? Or what could their mission in the church have been had they gone another way? It's an unanswerable question. It's one we don't know, but will be revealed in heaven, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's all the questions we have. But I've been I've been told by a little birdie that your special Fandangle microphone that I can see that you've got there, um, it's got a reverb sound effect on it. Yes, yeah, true? it does. And it, I've heard that it's great for like singing hymns. Is that right? Um, it may be true. I am losing my voice, as you can hear at the moment. So I don't know where this is going, Anya. But uh, what exactly are you asking me like, right it's now? It's definitely. I'm, not I'm having trouble discerning the spirit of what you're saying. Um, I really feel like the spirits are calling you to um, use that function on your microphone, but you can discern otherwise. Mm. <laughs> Give the people what they want. Yeah, Gemma, <laughs> good old sibling bullying. That's right, isn't it? Just do that. No, you don't have to. I was, I was having a bit of a go, but... Um... Look, I'll, I'll give you... The, I could probably give you the, like the first line of the Salve Regina or something like do that. Do it. Bang it out. <clears throat> All right, just tell me if it's, uh, if it's working now. It sounds like you're in a giant hall. Salve Regina, Mate Misericordiae, Vita Dulcedo, Et Spes Nostra Salve, Ate Clamamus, Exules Firii Eve, Ate Suspiramus, Cementes et flentes in hac lacrimarum vale. I'm just going to finish it there. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Big claps, big claps. I feel like you need to change your background to be like either a church or a music hall or something like that because that was, that was fantastic. It was, it was all digitally aided. I mean, I felt it was real. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say a big thank you. Thank you, Deacon Sam, for joining us tonight. Um, 
I think this was like super practical. Um, so the books that you mentioned just for everybody um, as we finish up was The Discernment of Spirits by Timothy Gallagher. And there was another resource you mentioned, but I neglected to write it. Yep. Yeah, so it's uh, Discernment of Spirits by Timothy Gallagher, um, the book. And he has this condensed into a podcast, um, which is called the discernment of uh, he's got stacks of podcasts so i just got to get the right name it's the discernment of spirits setting the captives free where he kind of goes um chapter by chapter through the rules of discernment and he gives way better examples and he's been studying it for like 40 years so awesome and we've also like if anyone else is interested you can obviously pick up um, find yourself a little biography of St. Ignatius to try and understand where um, he was at in his life and how he kind of came to, to writing this, this spiritual practice. But um, I want to thank you once again for making yourself available to us and for sharing with us. 